Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Melissa Johnson. I'm the director of the Lung Cancer Research Program for Sarah Cannon. Today, Dr. Neil Love and I will discuss oncology today, promising therapeutic strategies for patients with progressive non-small cell lung cancer. Frontline non-small cell lung cancer has never been more complicated. We need a lot of biomarker testing in order to identify the best treatment for every patient. And so when patient when people ask me what do I do, I do start with NGS testing and PDL1 for all. And of course, PDL1 levels uh, are one way that I make my frontline treatment decision. The other is how symptomatic a patient is or isn't at diagnosis. So for a patient that has a PDL1 high tumor, and no symptoms of their disease, I would consider a PD-1 inhibitor, pembrolizumab, semiplumab, um, on its own. But for patients that have symptoms, I am, am increasingly attracted to the combination strategies of PD-1, PDL-1, and chemotherapy. And in some cases, like those patients that are PDL-1-0, um, I am also thinking about adding in a CTLA-4 inhibitor with chemotherapy and a PD-1 inhibitor. We know that at five years, a percentage of patients are doing really well with uh, single-agent immunotherapy. But of course, that's the minority of patients. About 30% of patients are alive at five years. And so that means that some of the patients that we see in the office are going to, to be those patients and still be on their Pembro or their semiplumab or whatever their immune therapy is uh, at five years, but the majority will not be. Somewhere in the 70 to 80% range are gonna need more treatment. And so the PFS is also important to these long-term outcomes. How long can we expect patients to be without progression? And those numbers are much smaller. So for example, from Keynote 189, when all patients received carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab, at five years, only 10% are progression-free. So this is just another piece of information from the data that we often cite that suggests that second-line options are uh, desperately needed for our patients. It's true that for other patients, we'll be able to add a little bit more with the addition of a CTLA-4 inhibitor, ipilimumab, or as we did in the Poseidon trial with tremolumumab. This trial showed us that when you compare patients that got dervalumab, tremolumumab, and chemotherapy, PDL one CTLA-4, and chemotherapy, with patients that got dervalumab chemotherapy, PDL one plus chemotherapy and chemotherapy alone, there was a difference for those patients that got the extra immunotherapy agent, the CTLA-4. And so for those patients that are very hard to harness the immune system, that's what I think of doing. Before you go on, I'm just kind of curious, I, I guess, uh, you know, doing what I do, I spent about an hour and a half earlier today going through some uh, trials related to bladder cancer and there, you know, it's kind of interesting. They have a positive Nevo study. They have a yes. positive Pembro study, but they have a negative Atezo study. And, you know, they, it's hard to see what the difference in the design is, why one would be positive and negative. And, you know, you see that all the time in oncology. Any, are there any trends that would suggest there are any substantial differences between any of these checkpoint inhibitors? Neil, I don't, I don't really think that there are. Um, I, the way I explain the uh, difference in outcomes to myself is just that as time goes more goes on longer, more and more patients gained access to PD-1 or PDL1 inhibitor therapy, and so there were fewer patients that were totally uh, uh, naive and had only had chemotherapy. I think the best example of that is the Avelumab trial in second line lung. It was the only trial that didn't show an improvement in overall survival in lung cancer um, with a PDL1 inhibitor. And w we would think that most patients get at least three months overall survival, irrespective of their PDL1 level. Another uh, question I have as you were going through your algorithm and the way you think through first line therapy, uh, uh, of course, we're talking about people without um, targetable mutations. I was curious what your, you know, your thoughts are, your impressions are about what's actually happening in so the so-called real world 
which you're probably more connected to than a lot of other investigators. Are there any, I don't know, mis misperceptions, uh, disparities out there in that algorithm actually happening in this country? I'm always seeing these real world things that say we, the real world's not a, not like clinical trials exactly. Well, what do you think? Yeah, I I actually uh, disagree with the uh, dissension and the criticism of the. Uh, U.S. community. Um, I think it all started with a little bit of misinformation that came out of the My Lung trial that was reported by Mackenzie Evangelist from U.S. Oncology at ASCO a few years ago. And while she reported uh, less than optimal testing rates, um, I think that there were a lot of hidden reasons that the testing uh, wasn't optimal. The tissue biopsies weren't as good. The uh, practice didn't know about liquid biopsy testing. Um, there wasn't enough uh, tissue left and the patient couldn't undergo a biopsy because they were symptomatic and needed treatment. And none of that was elucidated. The other thing was that the data was a little bit uh, old, or, or, or it was about two years old by the time it was reported. And in those two years, there were a lot of U.S. oncologists learning about how to do testing more facilely. The, what we never get around to talking about is the failure on the part of the healthcare system to help us with this testing. Every oncologist across the board understands that this is necessary for frontline lung cancer patients, but every hospital has a different answer to that question. And whether or not the testing can be done within 14 days is still an issue at hospitals like the one where I practice. And so if the patient comes to you um, and you see them before that 14 days, some hospitals aren't releasing the tissue for the testing to be done. And there are lots of nuances across the country about why uh, that would be and the different problems that are uh, that exist. It, 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 it likely is going to be a regional or even a state issue to get this resolved. And, uh, and it won't be uh, resolved at the federal level. What about the quality of biomarker testing that's out there, let's say specifically as relates to lung cancer? Obviously, as you were pointing out, PD-1 is such a critical biomarker. What do we know about quality? Who's doing these assays and the quality of them? I think that's another good uh, example of uh, the ways that technology is improving and the biomarker testing uh, that arena is changing day over day. I think for the most part, these days in the United States, most hospitals have the ability to do the companion diagnostic for pembrolizumab. We also have uh, the ability to send out for other uh, vendors. I suppose, each, uh, once again, each hospital system um, their uh, predominant assay for doing the testing depends on the champion uh, that started the conversation with the pathologists. I might say one other, uh, one other example of how testing is improving, and that's liquid biopsies. I think increasingly I'm hearing from the community oncologists with whom I partner uh, that they like using liquid biopsies for all the reasons that all of us do, because the turnaround time is, is rapid, um, because it's easier and the tissue issue uh, doesn't uh, become a barrier as often. And there are more and more uh assays uh, that are offering not just NGS tissue results, but even uh, RNA results and, and even HLA testing as a part of the package. So we're getting more and more information from that plasma-based testing, which I think is a step forward for all of us. And it's maybe a challenge for docs in practice to figure out, you know, which assays may be more uh, useful than others. What do you do when you have a patient who has metastatic disease as a non-smoker, you're highly sus younger, you're highly suspicious, but NGS is negative. You mentioned RNA. Is there a particular assay or set of assays you do in that situation? Um, I don't think there's a wrong answer. I I just think you have to pick one and get good at it uh, be, and get uh, to know somebody that you can call at the company when there's a problem uh, with tissue receipt, for example. And so when you jump around, uh, you, you probably spend more time uh, on the phone as a result. 
So uh, one more question before we get into a um, second line and beyond is the patient who needs treatment before you can get your biomarkers back. I'm curious, you know, that's been a scenario we've talked a lot about in our education programs. We hear a lot. Initially, we're hearing a lot of hold off on the IO. Then I started asking people, suppose the patient's a heavy smoker. So I'm curious today what you do when you don't have your biomarkers back, but you have to treat the patient. I, for a never smoker or an, or a m- minimal smoker, I would just give chemo and wait on the IO. The reason is as much as I don't want to give immunotherapy when I shouldn't, I've done it before. And the problem is that then when you get the EGFR testing back that shows the mutation, what do you do with the immune therapy? How long do you have to wait until the immune th- therapy is out of uh, a patient's system? Just had a patient actually last week who ended up in the hospital with respiratory failure after um, two cycles of chemo, the first with immunotherapy, and then I realized she had an EGFR mutation, stopped, gave a second dose of chemotherapy to sort of wash out the immune therapy, and then started the osimertinib. About a month later, she ended up coming into the hospital, and I was sure it was because of pneumonitis. But in point of fact, she had congestive heart failure from the osimertinib. And, uh, and it took us a while to figure that out because I was so sure that she had pneumonitis. She did have a pleural effusion. She had had a pleural effusion at baseline. And so I just thought it was cancer related and tapped it and didn't think much else of it. And then, you know, we, we, we did testing like a BNP and an echo and found that her EF had dropped to 35%. Her BNP was in the tens of thousands. Um, and really she started getting better with aggressive diuresis and uh and wow. not with steroids what so all of that That's to incredible. say uh you know i was i guess i had a guilty conscience <laughs> i thought i had you know given her pneumonitis and um you know i the right thing would have just been chemo for her just out of curiosity how long had she been on the osimertinib about an, less than a month it was uh it was wow. three weeks yeah wow Incredible. Um, so generally speaking, uh, what do you do uh, in these patients? Uh, and also, you know, we've heard uh, over the years this issue of, you know, you don't want to have an IO on board when you use targeted therapy. And a lot of that came out of hearing about EGFR. At this point in time, what do we know about all the other, tar- you know, targeted therapies that we use first line um, from that point of view? You know, maybe the one that's the most interesting to me is KRS G12C right now. Really? Really? Because we're learning that at least the Sotorasib data that uh, showed a little bit of transaminase elevation, showed a little bit of hepatitis, it may in retrospect have been because of immunotherapy. It's a little hard to uh, prove um, uh, at this point, but it does seem that when we give the KRAS G12C inhibitor up front, we negate that risk. Um, and so I, I, I do think there's something to that uh, paradigm that the immune therapy goes first and then the TKI is started pretty rapidly after that we need uh, to to think about in all of our patients. It doesn't happen in all oncogene-driven cancers. And maybe the ones that where the TKI doesn't work as well or, or maybe the ones that get a little bit of response to the chemo immune therapy, those, that middle group met um, BRAF, B, B, for example. I was going to say BRAF. Yeah, BRAF those, is the one I was thinking about. Those are patients I mean, BRAF, where they can I, be smokers. That's right. They can be smokers. Um, I've treated, a, 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 in retrospect, a BRAF positive patient got chemo RT followed by Dervalumab for a year and did really well. Um, and then uh, we found some tissue in the freezer to do the testing. She has not yet recurred, um, interestingly. Wow. But um, in any case, I, I do think that that IO hangover is an issue, but not an issue for every patient with an oncogene, certainly for EGFR and ALK. So one more question before we get into uh, recurrence. Uh, just kind of curious at this point, uh, what are you thinking about in terms of, you know, maybe cure? 
I mean, we talk about people who go progression free for five years. Um, you do have patients in your practice you think who have been cured from, of lung cancer from immunotherapy. I have a couple. I like to joke with my partner, David Spiegel, because he seems to have a ton. Um, so I don't know what he's doing right, and, and, I'm, and I'm not doing it yet. But um, absolutely, there are people. I think where we're seeing it even more is in the early stage setting, um, when patients right. don't have any cancer left at the time of resection. And they are right. much, much more likely to be cured. Right. All right, let's get into the real challenge, which is recurrence and... Uh, we start out here with ADCs, which is the hot topic. Yeah, that, that's right, Neil. That this I took this table, which is a little bit busy, and we won't spend any time on it from the educational book this year. Look at all the excitement. So much excitement that uh, our colleagues that wrote this chapter thought that uh, we needed uh, to review basically all of the targets um, listed on this page. Um, I describe... Uh, antibody drug conjugates as smart bombs um, that uh, attack the cancer and inject chemotherapy uh, right into the cancer cells. And patients really like that uh, idea that the drugs are targeted uh, for the cancer and not the regular cells. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about trope 2 ADCs because they certainly have been the darling of the non-small cell lung cancer uh, community this year. It, trope 2 is a glycoprotein that none of us uh, knew was so important or highly expressed in lung cancer until recently. Um, it's also a, a marker of poor prognosis. Um, and we can see in the Kaplan-Meier curve in the top right that patients that had high levels of trope 2 expression did less well than patients that had no trope 2 expression. And so the uh, the... The star has been datapotamab durextecan, dato DXD. This cartoon shows very nicely the structure of an antibody drug conjugate. On the left, you can see the antibody, monoclonal antibody directed against trope 2. And then it's connected via the tetrapeptide-based linker um, to the payload, which is the bomb. Um, in this case, an exotecan or toporisomerase 1 payload that's known as DXD. So the drug... Uh, the nickname for the drug is Dato DXD. Um, some of the attributes of an antibody drug conjugate that are summarized on the right um, <clears throat> include the DAR or drug to antibody ratio. It's really important, but it's a little misleading because the DAR of this um, antibody drug conjugate is four. We'll talk about trastuzumab durextecan. The DAR is eight. And we'll talk about patritumab durextecan. The DAR is eight. So it doesn't necessarily mean the drug is more toxic or more potent just because the DAR is higher. But what it does tell you is how many drug uh, payloads there are per antibody. And so that does get at this idea that, you know, you only have to find the target in a few places in the tumor, um, and then it injects a lot of payload or uh, chemotherapy into the tumor itself. So at, in October at ESMO 2023, we heard the results of the Tropion Lung 01 trial. This was highly uh, awaited for a few reasons, not the least of which was because it is one of now a handful of trials in which all patients have received chemo and immune therapy. So what we used to quote as the standard after chemo, uh, we've been saying for a while, well, we think patients do better after they've received immune therapy. So just keep that in the back of your head. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to this trope 2 antibody drug conjugate, Dato DXD, at a dose of six milligrams per kilogram once every three weeks by IV versus docetaxel at 75, our old standby. And uh, the primary endpoints were PFS shown in the top right and overall survival, which is not mature, um, but shown in the bottom right. So importantly, the PFS showed a statistically significant improvement um, in the time to progression for patients who received DATO versus docetaxel. So the first time that a drug has beat docetaxel has a ratio of 0.75 significant p-value 
Um, the interval overall survival, you can see those curves are uh, pretty much overlapping, but um, at least the hazard ratio is going in the in the right direction, and so we'll stay we'll stay tuned. Now, at the bottom of the graph, um, and actually on the next slide, we'll see the. Uh, the primary endpoint PFS separated by histology. And this is where things got a little bit more interesting, in my opinion. Patients were uh, enrolled irrespective of, of histology and patients were stratified by their histology. So on the left, you see that indeed for patients with non-squamous cancers, the date of DXD was better. They certainly um, had improved PFS over docetaxel. But on the right, you see the squamous cancers. And in those patients, they actually did better with docetaxel. Look, you see the lavender curve on top and the pink curve on the bottom. Um, and so this was a little surprising. No one was expecting to see that there was a difference. We certainly hadn't seen a signal in the phase one trial of this. Um, and so this has um, made the community, I think, go, hmm, and uh, is maybe one of the reasons that we haven't heard um, uh, about the approval of this, of this drug yet. You might say, Neil, looking at the left-hand side, that the reason that the non-squamous did better is because they always do better and because the that group of patients included EGFR and ALK and other actionable genomic alterations, those AGAs. But at the very bottom of the slide, you see the PFS hazard ratio for non-squamous without AGAs. So they took all the oncogenes out of that analysis and still... Um, the PFS hazard ratio favored treatment with Dato DXD. So it does seem to work better in non-squamous patients and not just because they had um, alterations. So uh, I guess I'm curious if there are any hypotheses out there about why this histology thing uh, was seen. Also, this may seem like a strange uh, question, but what do you think a trial would show of docetaxel versus palliative care? Oh, well, that that trial's been done many years really? ago, right? Yeah. Um, one of the tax trials was one of the tax trials was versus another chemotherapy, venerelbine tax 326. But then there was another trial that was before that that was docetaxel versus um, best supportive care. And the overall survival was in favor of docetaxel, even, even at that point. So that's why I think it became the, the, standard, the standard drug, the standard drug in the refractory setting. Well, that's a good I, you know, reminder. I, docetaxel is an active drug. Um, from my work with Code Break 200, where Sotorasib was compared to docetaxel, that was a humbling example and reminder that docetaxel is active across all non-small cell lung cancer, um, but just in a non-selective way. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you feel comfortable, you know, buying into this sort of uh, histology breakdown? I, I buy this. Um, I, what I know is that not all patients do well with Dato DXD. I think if we if we go forward and talk a little bit more about toxicity, um, it, it didn't even really necessarily come out here. But what what does come off the page is just this signal of toxicity in the GI adverse events, specifically stomatitis and nausea, right. which were higher in Dato DXD than they were in do docetaxel. You know, we consider both mucositis and nausea to be associated with docetaxel, right? Just um, they were considerably more associated with Dato DXD. So Dato does have side effects. Um, but across the board, if you look at the severe side effects and the uh, adverse events of special interest shown on the right-hand side, the mucositis, yes, Dato was higher. A little bit of a higher um, uh, rate of ocular events, dry eye and blurry vision. Um, and then um, adjudicated uh, ILD, that seems to be the the side effect um, that's associated with the class, not just with this agent, you do see that there is a safety signal here. Um, and I just wonder if the patients that I treated, 
had some of these side effects and maybe were in retrospect were squamous cancers. And that's why I remember them not benefiting um, to the same degree. So I, I, this was, this did answer a big question for me because we participated in the phase one trial um, of, of this agent. And I remember thinking, gosh, my colleagues are having an easier time giving this drug than I am. And now I just wonder if maybe I was giving it to more squamous lung cancer. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, drilling down more, though, on the uh, toxicity issues, one of the things that's kind of interesting in terms of the stomatitis is at the same time the lung paper was presented, there was a similar breast paper presented. And the breast people have a lot of experience with mucositis from Everlimus and a lot of other drugs. And they they are telling me that that works for Dato, but the lung people, I'm not so sure I'm hearing that. It's true that I, that has been a, a difference that I've heard um, be, in my Erica Hamilton, my partner, right. who's my neighbor. Sure. Um, she'll say the same thing, that you have to scare patients into using that mouthwash four times a day, the steroid mouthwash. Um, eating ice or sucking on popsicles is a new uh, is a new thing that I've heard that definitely helps as well. I wonder if maybe we'll get to a place in lung where we feel that way as well. Um, and certainly in that case, then it does add options, right? Well, the other thing is you're like among the last groups to get into the ocular story. We've already done a CME program just on ophthalmic issues and oncology already, you know, particularly not just ADCs too. There's other drugs, you know, ertafitinib, yes. et cetera. So like, and I still, even after doing that program, I'm not exactly sure the difference between, I mean, I know central serous retinopathy and stuff like that, but there's this other dry eye, et cetera. You've actually used data. Like, have you seen any ophthalmic issues? You know, I, I haven't seen any uh, ophthalmic issues with data. I, I do think their, uh, their incidence is low. Um, but, you know, I, I have always thought that you shouldn't mess with cancer patients' eyes. So it, it does feel as though it's something that we should we should tread very lightly around. What's the thinking right now? You know, I kind of remember thinking before asthma, before we saw the data, I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be second line therapy breast too. I was all expecting that. And they also, I think, are are thinking through exactly how to process this. But I think it's maybe even more complicated in the lung it sounds like you're maybe a little ambivalent about uh, using this, or are you ready to go? I think this will get approved. I, I think I'll I'll have this as an option to use six months from now. I, I think how can it not be approved in breast? Um, I hear my GU colleagues talking about it. Uh, uh, now some of the trials are enrolling kidney and prostate, um, and so. I, I think it will end up with an approval. I don't know whether it'll be tumor type by tumor type or if it'll be more agnostic. Um, we don't know how to figure out who should get it. And I think that would help me give it a lot more confidently if I knew the patients that uh, are sure to benefit because whatever biomarker was positive. I, I hear that that's... non squamous <laughs> there you go. That's the best. You, I think that's the best you've got right now. <laughs> it is <you're> right. <laughs> I do hear that there's trope two expressed in the tongue. That's the reason for the mucositis. Which oh really? Is that's yeah. A, that it. Yeah, that really is interesting. Well, the other thing is, you know, speaking of GU, you know, bladder's got first line IO plus ADC. I mean, it beat the hell out of platinum chemotherapy. Uh, yes, and so right. that idea of I.O., I'm wondering whether Dato in the long run, it's going to be I.O. Dato that's going to come. I don't know. You tell me. I know they're looking at it. They're certainly looking at it, not just in bladder. They're also looking at right. it, I think, as we go. Sure. Uh, we'll talk about it in, in lung as well. And there may be some places, um, one of the trials I think that uh, – I wouldn't be surprised is positive is the tropion lung 08 trial, which is Pembro plus Dato for PDL1 high. That makes sense to me. If you can convince the patient, you know, that the extra toxicity is okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I was asking the GU people, why did they do so well? I mean, chemo and IO didn't do that great in bladder, but ADZ and IO, so I don't know. Interesting. It is sort of like uh, TKI and IO that also does well, kidney um, and bladder some. Right. Um, that's a and good point. So, That's a- you know, you wonder if you have to irritate the tumor in order for the immune system to find it. Well, let's move along to CCAM5. I think uh, uh, this is an, uh, an experiment and an investigation that I think we can all learn from. Uh, the C- the anti CCAM5 701 that we'll uh, learn got a, a name. Uh, on the next slide was a different sort of antibody drug conjugate. And it was uh, actually looking for uh, CCAM5 expression on tumor cells. In this case, the payload or the the bomb part was metansinoid or DM4, which is another common payload um, linked uh, to uh, antibodies uh, in antibody drug conjugate constructs. And there was uh, high levels of expression of CCAM5, not just in lung cancer, but also in pancreas and breast cancer and gastric cancer uh, in early studies. And so we saw the results of this phase one study of tusamitimab ravtansine. Tusa is a nice nickname for this one um, at ASCO a few years ago. It didn't just enroll lung cancer, by the way. It enrolled uh, small cell gastric and colorectal as well. Um, uh, Over the course of the trial, though, the patients with lung cancer were separated into those whose tumors expressed high levels of CCAM5 and those with moderate levels. And if you look at the waterfall plot in the bottom left, you can see that the patients that did the best on the trial that had partial responses were in green, and those were the lung cancer patients, um, and they were uh, they were more likely to be high CCAM5 expressors. Moreover, the swimmer's plot on the lower right uh, does show the duration of response and up to many, many months of treatment for many of the patients that had harbored partial responses. And so with this information as really the rationale, uh, TUSA went forward into a couple different studies, um, into a large phase three that we'll talk about on the next slide, but also into a phase two open label study evaluating uh, this drug in combination with, surprise, surprise, platinum pemetrexid to be used in non-squamous patients in the front line. So this was all lung cancer patients. Um, You see the top arm, the navy blue arm, was just TUSA and PEMBRO. Um, Then the maroon arm was TUSA, PEMBRO, and platinum. And then the green arm, those are the patients that got the quad therapy, PEMBRO, uh, platinum, pemetrexid, and TUSA. This was a small study. You see single digits of patients in each cohort, but evaluating a couple different doses. And probably the thing that, uh, that, bubbled up from this analysis was the grade three toxicity event rate, which uh, was about 68%. um, And corneal treatment emergent adverse events related to any cause, 24% of patients. Um, So this started to emerge as uh, yet another eye toxicity that patients were having on the right, you see a, uh, a safety analysis of corneal adverse events reported in patients, not just lung cancer patients, all tumor types. Um, that didn't seem terrible, 30% treatment emergent adverse events um, without any grade four or serious blindness, but keratitis and keratopathy in around one in five patients on study. You know, I, I, uh, I think that in and of itself was a little sobering, but not uh, not a reason not to give the drug if you could figure out who to give it to. And so the phase three trial that was launched was Carmen LCO3. Uh, the, the schema is sh- simply shown on the left-hand side. Patients had to express high levels of CCAM5 in order to be enrolled. And so uh, and then they were randomized one-to-one to this selected antibody versus docetaxel. And the primary endpoints were the same as the DATO trial, PFS, and overall survival. But the big difference was the selection, right? And so we found that we uh, had to screen 20 patients to treat one on this trial. Um, and that patient, as it 
turned out, got randomized to docetaxel, um, to tell a patient that you're waiting for a biomarker result and then you don't get the biomarker uh, directed therapy, you get docetaxel is, is challenging. I guess it's not that much different from a targeted therapy versus docetaxel, but that is the main reason that these trials are so unpopular. And it, it did, uh, it did take a long time to enroll. It enrolled really well in Europe, um, less well in the United States and probably due to data DXD and other, um, competition is the reason why. Just at the end of 2023, we had a press release that, um, announced that this trial did not meet its primary endpoint. And uh, so it didn't improve PFS over docetaxel alone. And uh, so the manufacturer uh, would discontinue the development of the program. So could you tell me a little more exactly what CCAM is? Is it CEA? Yes, it's CEA, but expressed on the cell, on the tumor cell and not, uh, and not freely floating. Okay. And um, when you started talking about this, you were saying, you know, kind of lessons learned. Looking back on this, like, what did we learn? It, it seems like it looked like there was an early signal that didn't play out. Why do you think that was? Well, I, th I think if we go back a couple slides, you know, there, these are these are pretty small numbers. Um, you know, 11 patients in a phase one trial. Um, that uh, were highly selected. These were patients treated for greater than 12 months. I think we assumed in the era of Dato DXD and other trope 2 ADCs where selection um, was not required, that actually maybe you just needed a little bit in order for the drug to work, also her too low. Um, and maybe a more sophisticated understanding of each of these antibody drug conjugates is what's needed. These drugs are really cool, but very sophisticated. And the, the degree to which uh, the antibody binds for each of the drugs is different. The degree to which the linker and the payload um, are connected or cleavable is different. And uh, how much of the payload can uh, accidentally get cleaved in, into the circulation unnecessarily or unwantingly um, is, is variable. And so I think to treat all of these the same probably was the, maybe the mistake here. Um, but I think it was an effort to, to make a play in, in oncology and lung cancer in particular. So, you know, it also brings up another thought that I've had um, and I'm really curious about. We could probably spend a long time, but in terms of how research gets done nowadays, particularly compared to even 10 or 15 years ago, because for us on the outside, you know, it looks like industry is way more involved than they were 10 or 15 years ago. You know, I, I guess that's a huge understatement. But I, I'm always curious about how people in industry interact with people in academia in formulating their plans do they do you get involved with these kind of discussions do you know the people in academia or is that all you know siloed inside industry you're not exposed to it or are you kind of part of it i think i can remember going to a, a steering committee uh meeting many years ago at aacr about this uh molecule actually but of course at the time that any company is ready to talk externally about a molecule. It, you know, it's been uh, it's been investigated thoroughly. I think probably many decisions have been made at that point. Um, and at the time where someone in academics or someone that has experience across a number of antibody drug conjugates, just for example, might say, "Well, I might not do that." You know, the, the phase three trial's been inked because, unfortunately, speed is, uh, is king uh, in drug development because it is so expensive. And I also am curious about how they do it. You know, I can't even imagine how do you sit down and, you know, with these kinds of budgets that must be considered and prioritize, you know, what you do, how do you bring in laboratory research? And it's just, I don't, I'm just really fascinated. I wish I could learn more about it. It, I do think that translation remains 
the magic, you know, that to see something work in the in the cell lines and in the mice, whether that's at an academic facility or in 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 um, industry. And to take that into a human being is just a big leap, no matter how you slice it. And uh, to assume that what does well in one should do well in another is is limited, limiting. I mentioned that uh, program on, on lymphoma the other day in Hodgkin, because, you know, one of the things I was noticing is they have a lot more intergroup studies than, say, lung cancer. And I guess that's because there are a lot fewer people with Hodgkin than non-small cell. Mm-hmm. kind of makes sense. Is that also something that you're seeing, that industry is kind of g- going after the common tumors and the cooperative groups still have to deal with the less common tumors? Yeah, but, it, but even in lung cancer, we're going to run out of patients. Uh, I think this antibody drug conjugate space is a good example of there, there's no way that we can treat all patients on a on a trial and satisfy all the trials that are out there right now. The KRAS G12C space is super saturated with trials in the front line. And so if we do those trials, then none of those patients are going to be able to do those tri- do other trials in the second line. I see it uh, every day in the phase one clinic. Um, I took, saw an ampullary patient and a thyroid patient today. It was really hard to find trials for them where the lung cancer patients have, you know, four and five options and they can't do them all. So there is a, there is a mismatch there in a, and we're missing opportunities to develop drugs, I think, um, in, in patients that are interested and um, available. So I'm going to turn off my microphone and be quiet so you can get through your slides. I'm just, you know. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about another trope two antibody drug conjugate. Of course, sasituzumab govotekin is, is going to be well known to some of your audiences, Neil, because it's approved in breast cancer. The community oncologists have been using this drug for a while. It's new to lung cancer doctors. And so I show this uh, phase one study. If you look at the bottom of the slide, this report was from the JCO in 2017. So this is in refractory patients, in refractory lung cancer patients bef- who, who had not all received immunotherapy. So a long time ago. In this group of patients uh, that were treated with this trope 2 ADC at the time, I think the response rate was around 16, 17%. The duration of response, six months, PFS, four months. And you might say, well, wait a minute, that that sounds very similar to what we are uh, expecting uh, these days. But at the time, this drug was housed or it was put back on the shelf and it was um, evaluated in breast cancer. And But of course, with the success of Dato DXT, this came off the shelf and um, is being studied in a number of trials. This Evoke 2 is um, a frontline lung cancer trial in which patients uh, are receiving sasituzumab or SASEG um, with immunotherapy for patients that are PDL1 greater than 50% and gre- and less than 50% in two cohorts, the navy blue cohorts, and then with chemo and immune therapy in the teal cohorts. Those teal cohorts have not yet been reported. But at World Lung last summer in Singapore, we heard the first results of this Evoke 2 trial in the front line. And, the, and this is a just a phase two trial with uh, the response rate is the primary endpoint. And so I was excited to see this, that in patients that had pdl one high tumors, we would expect them to get around 35% response from the uh, pembrolizumab. And we would expect them to get 20% or a little bit more with the sasituzumab govotekin from the past data. And look, they were getting 70%. So this is certainly at least additive between those two drugs. I do like the spider plot. It shows patients are staying on trial. Um, They're having durable responses and they're continuing to be stable. Um, And then the response rate in the group of patients, 50% and less, um, a little less strong, but nevertheless, um, you know, within the realm of uh, of the conceivable. And so this Evoke 2 trial goes on. Now, 
even with this trope to ADC, there's a curveball. And that curveball, we don't have all the answers for yet, but a vocal one is actually sasituzumab versus docetaxel. So this is the same trial design as the Dato DXD tropion lung one trial that I just uh, showed you. And it's very similar in design. Patients were randomized one-to-one to sasituzumab, govotecan, or docetaxel. Um, main difference, sasituzumab is day one, day eight, once every three weeks, as opposed to Dato, that's once every three weeks. In January, we there was a press release um, that announced that the Evoke 1 study did not meet its primary endpoint of overall survival. Oh yeah, that's the other big difference, is that while the tropion lung 01 was prime was co-primaries, PFS and overall survival. This is just overall survival. So my hat's off for going big or going home. Um, we haven't seen the results yet to know they do say in the press release an, a numeric improvement in overall survival favored sasituzumab, and that was observed irrespective of histology in the study. Um, so more to come here. It is it is intriguing to say the least. Um, what if the data in the squamous patients looks good? Could it be that this is the squamous option and the dado is the option for the non-squamous? We don't, do we know whether or not the PFS was benefited? It was a secondary endpoint, so it wasn't reported in the press release. But I mean, at this point, we don't know that it's going to be any, the data is going to be different than dado, I guess, do we? That's right. And it, and you're you're always so smart. The 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 overall survival in the data, lung one data, was no difference. So, um, so you're right. So uh, some of the answers um, are to be determined. I would say. And of course, the big thing is you got the SASE plus IO coming along too. Yeah, and that looked promising. So it's not it it's down, but maybe not, and it's certainly not out. I want to see the PFS based on histology for this. Yep. And the other thing that I think will become more relevant, as maybe even in the front line, is the difference in toxicity between these two drugs. These drugs are very yep. different, yeah. even though Absolutely. they target the same uh, 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 target. That's fascinating Absolutely. to me. And, and again, underscores how these drugs are so different one from the other. The uh, SN38 is the payload here with sasituzumab. So that's Topo uh, isomerase uh, derivative as well, but yet no stomatitis, um, minimal nausea. There, uh, this drug does have diarrhea, um, but overall seems to be tolerated uh, differently. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think in breast, you just hear more about new, you know, cytopenias, not so much quality life stuff. You know, no, yes. I never heard anything about uh, stomatitis or eye things. So. Yeah, this and no may, ILD. Uh, I was curious. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean, Sassy's used, we were talking about bladder. Sassy's approved in bladder also, so it works. Yeah. That'll be very yeah. interesting. And because right. it's already approved, you sort of wonder, you know, the slide happens a little bit easier when you already have a drug approved in one right. indication right. to the other, right. as opposed to data that's not yet approved anywhere. So it it right. is, it's a fascinating um, uh race. All right. So we can go on. I've got a couple other ADCs that I just wanted to mention. Taliso V has been uh, a kid on the block for a while. We've been trying to figure out exactly where we should be given this drug. This is an um, antibody drug conjugate directed against MET. It has been explored in patients with high medium and uh, and low levels of MET expression in the tumor and really found, found to be the most effective for patients with high levels of MET expression. So whether that's a, a wild type group of patients who just has MET um, uh, over expression um, on the cell surfaces of the tumor cells, or if this is an EGFR patient population with MET as their acquired resistance driver, that seems to be the areas where this drug um, is being evaluated and tested. And so this telemet uh, lung one study design randomizes 300 MET high 
patients to telesov or docetaxel. So this is yet again um, uh, a trial in the refractory setting, still ongoing, um, but again has a pre-screening component, so a selection criteria that helps identify patients. So that is appealing to me, even though MET overexpression is not something that we routinely test for in lung cancer currently. And there are there are lots of others. Uh, today, I saw patients in uh, the drug development unit who were being treated with antibody drug conjugates against folate receptor, against um, uh, Claude in 18.2, um, against CD71, against mesothelin. So there, there are a number of other targets. Of course, there are other payloads, even sting agonist as a payload in an antibody drug conjugate. And so in some ways, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. I uh, would be remiss without a mention of tumor treatment fields. This is a, a, a novel uh, therapeutic. Can I even call it a therapeutic? Essentially, tumor treating fields are two electric fields um, on uh, that exert a physical force or gravitational pull. And so this is used to disrupt the proteins during cell division um, in such a way that allows the cancer cells not to grow and divide as usual, but actually instead to commit to cancer cell death. So it is a, a really unique mechanism and actually one without any treatment-related toxicity. And so why shouldn't we find a way to use it in lung cancer? Um, the Lunar study was reported at ASCO this year. It was much uh, awaited. It did take a long time to enroll this trial, and patients were randomized to, uh, to TTF with standard of care or standard of care alone. Now, at the time that the trial was designed, the standard of care post uh, chemo platinum in the front line was either immune therapy or docetaxel. And so at the beginning, both of those options were allowed in the trial. But of course, IO moved up into the front line as standard of care. And so those two groups were separated um, uh, for the purposes of analysis here. The primary endpoint you see is overall survival. And look, there is a difference. Uh, median overall survival uh, point has a ratio of 0.74 and a significant p-value in favor of TTF treatment fields. But here we have, I think, uh, where the rubber hits the road, if you will. Uh, this is the overall survival amongst the two groups that were treated in this trial. The patients treated with ICI plus TTF on the left and patients treated with uh, TTF plus docetaxel uh, on the right. That would be the current standard of care um, after frontline platinum immunotherapy. Of course, we see an improvement uh, for patients treated with immunotherapy plus uh, uh, tumor treatment fields, but not for the chemotherapeutic plus TTF. It does uh, help your imagination to suggest that as uh, you disrupt the polarity of the cancer cells and stop the cell from dividing, that does induce some immunogenic stimuli, if not immunogenic cell death. But the truth is that that will be hard to take forward in the frontline setting um, just because of all of the other drugs that patients are currently uh, receiving. What is that um, thing with the FDA? We found a press release that yeah, from early January that announced that a pre-market approval application seeking use for TTF fields uh, together with standard systemic therapies following platinum um, was accepted, uh, the application was accepted by the FDA, not that TTF was approved, but the application for approval was accepted, the PMA. So I think we'll see. I know that there are a lot of trials trying to take this one step further, um, both in the in the front line as well as in the third line setting. So after chemo RT, could you add TT, TTF to Dervalumab? And and that's unfortunately uh, we have heard recently that they're going to pause that trial in order to go uh, forward with their frontline efforts. 
Um, so I guess that's chemo immunotherapy with or without TTF. Everybody wants to be in the front line. Um, I do think that the third line setting is interesting to me. Um, that's somewhere where it just seemed like a simpler trial design and w- where patients might be a little bit more motivated to do it, but we'll see. Um, I was disappointed to hear that that trial would go on, uh, would go on pause. Yeah, that is a shame because that's a great idea. Yeah, we've been following this ever since GBM, you know, waiting to see what's going to happen. I th- I've always thought it was real interesting, but we'll see. Just a couple more uh, antibody drug conjugates that I wanted to mention, um, because these are also coming, I think, uh, ra- uh, coming forward rapidly. One is pertritumab durextecan. This is a HER3 antibody drug conjugate. So the target is HER3, which you'll remember is often uh, complexed with HER1 or EGFR to stimulate downstream receptor uh, uh, internalization and signaling in a cancer cell. So EGFR mutated patients um, was a natural place for this drug to be tested. And so the first trials, including Herthena Lung01 shown here, the schema for which um, Helena Yu presented the data at uh, World Lung in this summer, um, was in patients that had progressed on an EGFR TKI. You see a couple different dosing strategies were evaluated. The primary endpoint in this phase two trial was objective response. And you see the nice waterfall plot in the upper right showing um, a response rate of around 32%. Um, about one third of patients had uh, had response to this therapy. This is a well-tolerated therapy, Neil. Um, it feels different than dado to me. Um, cytopenias are the most common side effects, uh, some hair thinning, um, but, but not a whole lot else. This is yet another antibody drug conjugate being tested in a number of tumor types, including small cell lung cancer. Ifenatumab durextecan is targeting uh, B7H3, which is shown at the top, uh, the cartoon at the top. The waterfall plot's cool here because this shows all the patients that were treated in the phase one trial. So this, and if you look at the slide carefully, you can see many different tumor types included, including uh, esophageal squamous cancer, prostate cancer, squamous cancer, um, squamous lung cancer, as well as small cell lung cancer. Um, and there were, the response rate across the, all of the phase one trial was 40%. And exciting for us in small cell, in, in small cell lung cancer, the response rate was 50%. Uh, so a promising target. It's being studied now in a phase two study to confirm the right dose in small cell, um, and we'll go forward in a phase three trial to follow. And one last one, uh, CDH6 targeted therapy. This is D- DS6000. This is a cool trial that uh, has also run at Sarah Cannon. It only enrolled ovarian and kidney cancer. Uh, Erica Hamilton presented this phase one data a couple years ago at ASCO, and uh, we continue to enroll ovarian cancer patients in this um, just goes to show that, you know, there are a lot of places where these drugs uh, seem to work. Um, and we haven't answered the question yet. Could you treat any tumor type with an exotecan uh, directed ADC and expect to see a response rate somewhere between 25 and 40%? I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, but these certainly are hot drugs. Uh, They have resulted in collaboration between huge pharmaceutical companies. This is a small cell who you see she she had shrinkage uh, on this antibody drug conjugate. And then um, the very next scan developed uh, pretty significant pneumonitis, hypoxia, um, shortness of breath, and uh, required steroids. Um, So just when you think it's working well. um, What ADC was it again? It was it was what, IDXD. Was the patient symptomatic? Very. Came in short of breath, really? breathing at forty. I uh, knew wow. something was wrong, and she, she she assumed her cancer was back, 
and uh, hmm. and said, I, I just wanted to get to today. Like, what do we have to do? And I said, I think you have pneumonitis. Um, and she got better rapidly on a prednisone hmm. taper. Hmm. Uh, pretty satisfying, but pneumonitis is, uh, you know, a hex. So I couldn't put her on anything else, any other trials. Um, it, it, she was a hard fit for everything else immunotherapy related because of the pneumonitis. So there is a cost. How about your other case? The other case is just, um, just a lady I saw last week, Asian female, never smoker, um, she was on OC for a long time, switched over to pertritumab at 5.6. Um, in the first cycle, her platelets went all the way down to 10. We transfused. We tried one more time, went down to 25. And so we had to dose reduce. Um, I think we probably dose reduced, honestly, between 10 and 25, between cycle one and cycle two. Um, and then she had dose delays subsequently, but we were always able to get her platelets back in range and keep going. And then in, um, bit by bit developed anemia, required transfusion, um, and uh, did, did that dance for a few cycles, you know, transfused her up, got her ready to go, treated her. And then she, you know, uh, continued to lose blood. So we dose reduced her again. She remains without evidence of disease now, uh, wow. after, after two years of therapy. So, wow. you know, she, she's done so well, uh, but, and this is a potent drug that works at lower doses. So, uh, I mean, it, it seemed, I don't remember hearing a lot about cytopenias with the other deroxicans, TDXD, DATO, did they see that earlier on as they were optimizing the dose or this is and you, you get cytopenias with this drug particularly because you had mentioned yeah. that this is it is fascinating to me how i mean platelet count of 10 i mean you can't make Plate it count of like, 10 <laughs> i was like do i need to send her for a brain scan <laughs> no, but, and she was like no i'm fine <laughs> wow jeez so, yeah. Um, so it, 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 it isn't interesting that like, why would targeting her three, uh, cause cytopenias? I have no idea. It's the same payload as trastuzumab deruxtecan. So interesting. So, uh, it is interesting. And thanks so much. I learned so much today. It was really uh, great. I'll close by telling you the, I don't know if I ever told you this, the only joke I ever made up in, in oncology. Tell me. <laughs> it's it's if you it's like what would you call the name of a drug that was an antibody to her three? Trastrezumab. <laughs> Did you make that up recently? I made it up all by myself. That's the only all joke I've ever made in my whole life. <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> That's a good one. I'll use right. that one if you don't mind. 